Welcome to another Striper Season Update brought to you by West Marine. The weekend is here, and once again, so is the foul weather. If you missed last week's Striper Season Update, you can check that out because it's all about fishing in rough surf, which we will have no shortage of this weekend. In terms of the Striper migration, not much has changed since last week. We're still watching those fish settle into their summertime rhythms. So with that, myself, Jimmy Fee, and Kevin Blinkoff decided to have a little recap of the spring run. So last Friday, we did our last striper migration map. We usually have the last one end of June, early July. So July 2nd was our last one of the year. Uh, Kevin, you put that together. What, you know, where'd everything end up? Also, why do we end it then? Why do you end it in July as opposed to keep it going? So, so typically we do the last one right before the July 4th weekend or sometime around then, because that's when it seems like the stripers have really kind of settled in. Um, so most of the major movements of, of fish school seems to have ended. Um, obviously, some fish will still continue shifting, especially shifting north. But for the most part, they've settled in. Striped bass have reached up to southern Maine. Um, and we start to see really like the, the typical summer spots that always hold big striped bass. Um, the fish are there. The fish are settling in. So that's our last one of the year. And it's, it's a good time to kind of look back and say, what? happened this year what was different than previous years um how would you characterize the run this year yeah so andrew uh you do a lot of work with the striper cup i know you see a lot of the entries that come in uh in terms uh, i mean and that itself gives a pretty good view of of where the good fishing is you see if you've got a lot of entries coming in from new jersey and then that tapers off i mean overall based on the entries you got for this year's striper cup how would you say the spring run run was i would say it was a great spring run it was a little bit unconventional in that we kind of had a lot of really great fishing up in the rivers, um, up at Cape Cod. A lot of the first week submissions were those really small schoolie fish, you know, the first arrivals to the area. Yeah, that first week of uh, May when we start is kind of usually the uh, first week that we see the migratory fish up here on Cape Cod. So first week we had a lot of mixed bag submissions. We had a lot of really big fish coming out of the rivers, the Hudson and the Connecticut. And we also had a lot of bigger fish in the Raritan Bay area. So through it all, it's been a bit of a mixed bag, but it's been really fun to see the big fish work their way up into Buzzards Bay. Uh, Rhode Island, Narragansett Bay had a great season. A lot of big fish were taken out of there this year. Buzzards Bay, as I said, again. And then all of a sudden, it was kind of a little bit of a lull for a while on the big fish. And then it seemed like they had almost nearly teleported north of Cape Cod. And they were kind of there on Boston Harbor and in the North Shore by early June this year, which is you know, as early as we've seen it. Yeah. So for the past couple of years, um, I, I think starting last year, it almost seemed like there's a school of fish that bypasses Cape Cod and you see some 30 pounders up on the North shore of Massachusetts and in uh, Boston Harbor that didn't, wasn't quite as dramatic this year as it was last year. Um, but definitely there were some big fish that I think just took the ocean route around the Cape and, uh, and spread out from there along the, uh, you know, North coast of, uh, or North shore of Massachusetts. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tricky to compare from year to year because we all have different perspectives. Um, obviously, you know, Jimmy, you're a big Cape Cod surf caster. And so your perspective is, is really Cape Cod fishing. Um, and so we tend to look at that at the, from, from our point of view of, of what we saw. But I think it points to kind of like a bigger trend in the, the striped bass migration in spring, especially. It's gone from kind of, um, you know, almost, almost easier to predict in how it progresses it feels like it's become a little bit stranger, a little more, a little choppier as two things are happening. I would say one of them is there's fewer striped bass in the population that we know of, um, especially what they count the bigger female striped bass, fish over 20 pounds. There's simply fewer of them, and they're also not as wide of a, um, not as many in as different size classes. So we'll get to that in a second. But the other thing is the comeback of Menhaden. Um, so much of the spring run of big fish, where the big fish are and where they're being caught, seems to really depend now on where the menhaden are. And because of that, I think you'll have fish, especially big striped bass, will stay, for example, around Raritan Bay because they're eating so much menhaden. Um, they'll hang around down there. And then when they come up and move up into New England, they really kind of aggregate and stick around in areas where they have where they have menhaden, bunker, pogies, whatever you call them. So that seems to have you know really affect the striper migration as much as say what we used to always think was you know water temperature as it warms they just slowly move north now it seems like uh you know they're moving 
with the bait as well. And that's also where fishermen are catching them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, on our TV shows this year, we've managed to uh, do one show in the Raritan Bay. We did one in the Connecticut River. We did one in Narragansett Bay, um, you know, throughout the spring, the spring run of stripers. And in every one, Bunker played a big role in it. In Narragansett Bay, we were looking for for fish using uh, with Captain Rob Taylor using his side scan electronics to find uh, schools of bunker and then schools of striper that we you know the schools of stripers that were following those bunker schools. Um, so yeah, it's definitely played a big role. I've noticed in my surf fishing over the past you know two three years as the numbers of of bunker locally have exploded, and it's it definitely moves the fish around. I think going back five or six years. Most of the stripers I was catching and targeting, they were feeding on on bottom fish. I think they were feeding on uh, scup primarily because scup are a great bait fish. Stripers love to eat them. They form big schools. And, um, you know, I would catch good-sized bass. They'd be spitting up porgies. Kevin, you've seen that a couple times. We've been out there, and the bass are, uh, are spitting up those. Squid was another one we would see fish on in the springtime. Um, this year did not seem to be a very good squid run around the Cape. Seemed to be very short-lived even for the boats. Yeah, we did have some good fishing um, squid in the rips, uh, you know, Vineyard Sound rips, places like Middle Ground, Woods Hole, out to Chatham as well. Uh, smaller squid. What we didn't see this year was, I think, it, you know, several years ago, we had a run of uh, the offshore squid that came in and in the Cape Cod Canal, and that drove a, a big blitz. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think the Cape Cod Canal is like a great place to look at and and compare year to year, um, kind of a discrete place to say, like, how did this year compare to last year? And I think it's a great example. This year, we really didn't see the springtime blitzes that maybe we've seen in the past, um, which in the past were often driven by mackerel. Um, we would see big blitzes on mackerel in the springtime or on squid. Um sea herring, other types of bait fish. This year, really the best bite that I heard of um, in the canal was in June, there was a, a pretty good blitz of big fish that were on bunker, uh, pushed up some bunker through the West End. And if you were in the right place at the right time, it was it was incredible. Uh, but it's not like, uh, didn't seem to be like when they're on mackerel in the canal and it's like, you know, big blitzes that stretch out, that move back and forth. It's kind of a, a shorter term, um, more discrete area where these blitzes occur. So for Cape Cod Canal fishermen, I don't think that they would give this spring run very high marks just compared to past years. Year over year, it's been funny to see. Uh, 2020, there was still a good amount of big fish coming out of the canal in terms of Striper Cup submissions. But this year, it seemed like almost next to none were from the canal. Usually we're sharing a lot of those images um, as they come in, but a lot fewer from the canal this year. Yeah, the the... Bites I heard of this year were really short-lived. Like if you got there, you, usually, like Kevin said, when there's a mackerel blitz, the fish have the mackerel penned up in there, lasts for a couple days, you usually count on three to four good days of action. And uh, it seemed like with this bunker bite, if you got there the following day, you were already too late. Um, it just did not, they seemed like they blasted through real quick. And that could just be the way bunker behave versus how mackerel behave. You know, the bunker are bigger bait fish, probably a little bit stronger swimmers, more easy, you know, can easily overcome the currents and get away from the bass rather than the mackerel, which are, are smaller. And uh, once the bass have them in there, it seems like they, they just kind of play goalkeeper at either end of the canal, keeping the mackerel in there during those good bites. Now, how about the surf casting down in New Jersey, Jimmy? Um, in years past, I would say early on in the Striper Cup, the first five years, even say late 2006, 2010, we would see some huge surf caught bass come out of New Jersey. Um, those were fish that were on Menhaden usually at the time, I believe, and setting up these big blitzes along the Jersey Shore. Are we seeing much of that happening anymore? Whatever happened to that bite? So that was, man, that used to kick off sometime in late May, early June, and it, it pretty much coincided with the arrival of the Chesapeake Bay fish. You know, we weren't, I, I, it started around, I started learning about it around 2000, 2001. That's when I was actually living down there. Um, What's that? What is that noise? Okay. Yeah. So that really kicked off around 2000, 2001. And you had these tremendous schools in Menhaden. That was right around the time that uh, New Jersey banned the big um, reduction boats, the Menhaden reduction boats that were taking off, scooping up 
you know, you'd have two this two boat operation that would completely encircle a school in Manhattan. That they'd ship them off to Virginia to turn into uh, dog and chicken food. They kicked those out of state waters, so beyond three miles, and that allowed the the Manhattan uh, the bunker schools to really start to to explode inside three miles, which is where, of course, you're allowed to strike bass fish. And it created this excellent fishing. Uh, the boat guys got on it, and every once in a while, you'd have the southwest uh, or west wind kick up in the afternoons, and bunker tend to swim. The, you know, I, a lot of people think bunker swim into the wind. It helps them feed a little bit easier, and bass would take advantage of that and pin them between the jetties in uh, Ocean and Monmouth County, New Jersey. Guys would catch them snagging and dropping the bunker, catch them on pencil poppers, and that good fishing lasted through 2012 maybe 2011 2011 it was actually a new jersey surf casting team that won the striper cup you know they had a lot of big fish that they took all of fish over 40 pounds from the surf and uh man over the past 10 years that bite is all but all but vanished yeah you still hear some big fish coming out of the jersey surf but it tends to be you know one or two fish often at night um you know or a fish on bait or something like that but none of that blitz fishing where guys are getting 40 and 50 pounders on pencil poppers and snag and drop. Um, is that, does some of that have to do with changes since hurricane Sandy? You know, a lot of guys will say that, that, uh, it definitely changed the coastline. Hurricane Sandy was in 2012 and it was after the 2011 season, which was an incredible season to be a surf fisherman in, in New Jersey. Not only was the spring run great, the fall run was fantastic. You had sand eels along the beach. Then you had peanut bunker and just so many big fish swimming in the surf for New Jersey. Hurricane Sandy came, you know, did a lot worse, you know, than ruined people's fishing spots. You know, it ruined houses, it claimed lives, but it, it totally rearranged the beaches. And then the aftermath of that, was they wanted to prevent that kind of erosion, that large-scale erosion. So there's been beach replenishment projects. A lot of those jetties that were hot spots for the fishing for, for however many years. Now, jetties aren't natural. People put them there. I don't know how old they, how old some of those jetties are, but they they are intended to, to reduce beach erosion. Um, clearly, clearly, they're not that effective, but they notched a lot of those jetties because what, what a jetty does is, is it prevents the longshore drift. So naturally the sand is going to move i don't know if it's north to south um yeah well you falling asleep oh sorry i didn't <laughs> okay I well, thought well, i was so... i thought i was back in oceanography class <laughs> well why don't you explain it to us then what's longshore drift uh i didn't know we were going to discuss longshore drift i thought we were going to talk about striped bass okay all right so so forget that so the jetties they would notch the jetties to allow more natural flow of sand to hopefully keep the erosion uh to a minimum on these beaches. And not only did they do that, they pumped thousands and t thousands of tons of sand onto the beaches to build them up. That got rid of all the sandbars, all the bowls, it covered other jetties and rocks. So you lost all that good surf structure that attracted bait fish and then striped bass. And that's also, you know, that coincided with the striper population beginning to dip. And I think that those, you know, kind of really hurt the surf fishing in New Jersey. Yeah, I think we'll definitely hear from some New Jersey surf casters in the comments sharing their opinions on on what's happened to New Jersey fishing uh, from shore. And uh, maybe that's a good topic. We could do an entire show in the future, get some guys from uh, fr some New Jersey surf casters like Steve George down there, get him on to talk about that. But um, moving along with the spring run, one thing that we did see in Jersey in the spring this year was that Raritan Bay bite which has just been incredible. Now, that's something that seems to have only gotten better. Um, what, do, what are you thinking there, Jimmy? Are those Hudson fish staging before they go to spawn? Is that why that, that bite has gotten so good? I mean, that seems to be the general consensus. Uh, we fished with Captain Rob Radliff this year. He talked about how those fish begin to show up in late March, mid-March, and uh, those fish are staging and feeding in anticipation of running up the Hudson River to spawn. So you have a lot of bait fish there. Raritan Bay is shallower. It's got a dark mud bottom, so it's going to warm a little faster. Acts like a magnet to the bait fish, which act like a magnet to the stripers. And those fish uh, you know, feed pretty heavily there into May, run up the Hudson River to spawn. And then when they drop back out late May, early June, bait's still there, water temperature's still good. They'll hang there for a little bit until it gets too hot for them. And then a lot of them will slide uh, east along Long Island. And Andrew, what did you see in the Striper Cup early on, where a lot of those New Jersey fish appear to be rare and bay fish? So a lot of those fish did seem to be rare and bay fish. We had a lot of submissions from New Jersey, especially the bigger fish early on. And it seemed like right around then, we also had a lot of submissions going on in New York. And those were kind of areas that appeared to be um, 
upriver up the Hudson, you know, in week two and three of the Striper Cup. So it seemed like Raritan Bay lit up, and then all of a sudden we had a lot of photos of big fish up up in rivers. Yeah, kind of a um, a little bit of a sidebar. It a theory I have is that it seems almost like that Hudson River stock might be perhaps rebounding or have come back in recent years more than say the Chesapeake stock, or maybe there's problems in the Chesapeake stock. So it's it's tough to stay, say at this point, but it is interesting um, that with research that's going on right now, they're starting to do more and more genetic research. It will get to a point where we'll be able to tell if an individual fish, um, and, you know, we can already tell with genetic testing, but as they do more of it, we'll be able to see our fish in a certain area at a certain time, um, what stock are they from? And I think we'll end up actually managing striped bass eventually as sort of like, you know, the Hudson stock versus the Chesapeake stock. And if one is doing well and the other is not, they might change the way they manage the fishery a little bit. Um, it'll certainly give us more information. But that's one thing that I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we try and draw these generalizations across the, the whole striped bass population in the Northeast, when really there could be something going on there. There could be differences in the way that the different stocks are, are rebounding or declining. Yeah, I know the Chesapeake stock is the one that, that they say makes up 75% of the striped bass population. And I'm sure that ebbs and flows as, uh, you know, those those numbers, I'm sure, fluctuate just like the Hudson stock fluctuates. But um, it's, you know, I forget where I was going with it. But Kevin, you start the striper migration map in March. And that, you know, what do you see reports wise coming from the Chesapeake? Well, one thing that we've we've seen over the years now in the Chesapeake is um, they don't allow as much springtime striped bass fishing. So we have actually a really hard time getting striped bass reports. Uh, we used to actually get you know fishing reports out of the Chesapeake. Um, Maryland does a really great job reporting on what's going on with the fishing, but they close the striped bass fishery um, for a while down there, which is probably a good thing to allow the fish to spawn. You're definitely, you're not allowed to, to target them in a lot of the spawning tributaries. And then I think it's a full month. You're not allowed to target striped bass at all throughout the bay. Um, so it's cut down on kind of the amount of in, the number, the cut down, cut down on the information that we get out of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so it's, it's tough to say exactly what's been going on. So that's one of those reasons why this genetic research and being able to tell different stocks apart um, could probably give us a little more information. A lot of what we know about the health of the Chesapeake Bay striper population comes from the young of year juvenile surveys. That information tends to come out, uh, I believe it's late September usually. Yeah, it's late September, early October, because they're doing the surveys right now. Because the way they do that is they're 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 using a SANE net to get juvenile striped bass, and then they count them at, at various survey sites and then take an average of how many they see compared to past years. And that's how they get a, an indication of how successful the spawn was. That gives us some idea of how many juvenile striped bass recruit into the population after one year, how many were spawned in the spring and um, are still alive in late summer. So that's good, but we really you know, don't necessarily have such a great idea of how many of those fish then grow to survive to leave Chesapeake Bay. So um, that's definitely something scientists are trying to look into. Bringing it all the, back around, all the way back around to the spring run, um, a lot of that sort of um, what we're trying to track with that south to north movement is really trying to figure out when are fish from the Hudson heading up the coast and when are fish from Chesapeake Bay heading up the coast. The Chesapeake Bay fish tend to wrap up their spawn earlier, although it depends on the tributary and they don't all leave the bay at once. It's kind of um, certain tributaries spawn earlier and then those fish leave the bay. So those fish start to come north and then after that, the Hudson fish leave the Hudson River and start to come north. But if you're in a place like, say, um, you know, Massachusetts in New England, you probably see the Hudson fish first. Would you think that's that's correct, Jimmy? So I would have argued with you on that um, until I've heard a couple other people say that, that they think the big fish that Massachusetts sees first are the Hudson River fish. I always assumed it was the, the Chesapeake fish. You know, they're spawning beginning in April. They're probably out of the bay by early May. And then we, we start to see our bigger fish third week of May you know, last week of May. And then, uh, so to me, the timing seemed right for them to be Chesapeake fish, but I've heard from a few people talking with, you know, just the guys I, I fish with and, uh, you know, at the bait and tackle shops, I've heard multiple people say now that they think our, that our first wave of fish is the Hudson fish. And, and one of the clues I've heard 
is relating to the condition of the fish themselves. Um, and Jimmy, you do a lot of surf casting. You're, you know, obviously targeting bigger fish. Do you see at some point kind of differences in the fish themselves, how they appear? Like, can you, you know, do you, do you see a change in kind of the, the quality or the condition of the fish? There does seem to be the first fish you get in the season when the water's a little bit colder are cleaner fish. You know, you don't, they don't have any, any marks on them. They look almost pristine. And then there seems like sometime around mid June, you start seeing fish that have a varying amount of sores on them. Some of them, some of them are just absolutely covered in, in red spots and, uh, and look a little bit, you know, kind of rougher around the edges. And that does seem to coincide with, with mid June, um, probably, I'm oh, sorry, I just saw your comment. So probably would make sense. That is the, uh, the Chesapeake fish that have, have moved up. Because I know those fish have mycobacteriosis; they're coming through warmer water. Yeah, that could be the case. Again, we're kind of just uh, throwing out hypotheses here, but that's one of the reasons I've heard from a lot of people say, "Oh, the Chesapeake fish have shown up. Um, they're bigger and they've got sores on their bellies." It could be that they're just, um, you know, the first round of fish are cleaner fish because maybe they didn't spawn, maybe they didn't hang behind and get all roughed up spawning and, and get beat up that way. Whereas the fish that come a little later, they've, you know, bigger female striped bass spawning does rough them up and they lose some scales. They get beat up a little bit. So that could be it as well. Again, just throwing out theories. <laughs> so that really lines up with uh, what we see in the striper cup. You know, if you, even on our Instagram page, if you look back at, you know, that first week of May, the whole month of May, basically all those fish of varying sizes are all pretty much in great shape. You know, they're all, they're all like they're picture perfect stripers. Come the first week of June, mid June, you do see the ones that are beat up. You know, some of the stripes are irregular. It looks like they've been lost some scales, got some sores. So it definitely lines up with uh, what we're seeing in the striper cup. I think one of the trends this year we saw is that there were definitely more fish. There seemed to be more fish over 40 pounds being taken, seeing it on Instagram, hearing about it from friends of mine. Um, you know, starting in the Raritan Bay, going all the way up through Boston Harbor, it seemed like there were a lot uh, more than usual of large fish being caught, even even 50 pounders. I mean, it, through, throughout uh, the spring, it seemed like there was another uh, 50 pounder being taken and, and in the Raritan Bay almost every week, you know, and those are just the ones you're hearing about, it's just the ones being posted on social media or being shared with the reports. I'm sure there were many more that went uh, unreported. And I mean, I, it might be too early to say that, Kevin, but do you think that, that could be uh, the slot limit starting to show that, you know, there's more of these larger fish since they've already gone through a year without being caught, without being kept at least? Um, I, I think that would be great if that's true. Um, I personally think maybe it's a little too early to have that big of an effect, but hopefully, you know, that is what's happening, that you're having more fish survive, um, you know, beyond the upper end of the slot more of these bigger fish surviving and getting bigger. So that would be great. Um, but I think, you know, I, I agree with you. I've kind of seen the same trend. I don't know if it is the fact that now anybody who catches a big fish for the most part is sharing it. So, you know, guys don't keep it quiet as often anymore. You hear about the big fish on social media. Um, or it could just be also that, um, you know, now that fish that big have to be released, uh, you know, they're not you used to really... You used to see the fish when they'd be at the tackle shop on the scales and guys who caught and released fish wouldn't necessarily estimate the sizes or share them that way. Um, now, you know, every fish you catch, you can just post what size you measured it as and then let it go, um, which is a great thing. So I guess, you know, it could be many things, but hopefully it is the fact that we're seeing more catch and release, more conservation, and the regulations are forcing people to put these big fish back and they get another year to grow big and get caught again. Yeah, this is the second year in a row that no fish over 38 inches have been killed between, have been kept between uh, New Jersey and Connecticut. And then you do have commercial fisheries in Rhode Island and Massachusetts that allow the uh, the take of larger fish. Um, the Massachusetts one's underway right now. I haven't, I usually just keep an eye on the quota just because that gives you a good idea of how the fishing season's going as well as seeing how quickly the commercial fishermen are able to fill the quota. And uh, one thing that Massachusetts did this year, which seemed to go against public opinion was actually add commercial fishing days. The, the the commercial fishermen had fallen short, considerably short of the striped bass quota for the past, oh man, how many years has it been? Four? Uh, I think at least the last three. Um, you know, last year was a little 
different from all the others because of COVID. There wasn't the restaurant demand for commercial striped bass, and so there wasn't as much commercial commercial striped bass fishing um, taking place. But yeah, I mean, the Massachusetts fishery, which is managed by a quota, um, and then they're given certain days of the week that commercial fishermen are allowed to go out and try to fill that quota. In recent years, they've gotten toward the end of the season and have not been able to fill the quota with the days that they were given to fish. So this year, what the state has done is add days to the week that commercial fishermen are allowed to go fishing, um, with the idea being that they can give commercial fishermen access to that quota. The quota was set with the idea that this is a quota that works with the striper rebuilding process. Um, So I understand where the state's coming from there of, of saying, we've already decided this amount of striped bass can be kept by commercial fishermen, and so we should give them access to it to make money. But at the same time, anytime you're talking about let's increase the number of striped bass that we're keeping, um, you know, it's tough when we're trying to rebuild this population. It's tough to get behind that at all. What I didn't like about it is it went back on the whole reason they went to the, let's say, last year's structure where you had two days spread apart was to even out the pressure on the fish. Uh, you go back 10 years and you had five straight that you were allowed to commercial fish four or five days a week keep 30 fish a day, and then that went down to 15. But it allowed people to get on these big schools and just absolutely hammer them until, you know, the the, the fish either moved on or, you know, were, were nearly all caught and sold. So they wanted Massachusetts, which was a great move, wanted to spread out the commercial pressure, last longer. Also, the benefit to the commercial fishermen is that it kept the prices higher uh, by spreading the season out a little bit. And now they've gone back on that, which is them putting more pressure on, you know, these these – individual schools and uh that's that's what i didn't like about that regulation i understand that the quotas set you know that's the the number of stripers that can be be taken and still allow the the population to regrow but uh, you know i just didn't like that that implementation of it yeah i'm sure we'll get some comments from people with with opinions to share on uh with how they feel about commercial striped bass fishing and actually that could be an entire conversation in itself we can get some people on to uh talk about different viewpoints there but you know, moving back to the spring run, um, you know, that is something we'll keep an eye on. Keep an eye on how that Massachusetts fishery does. They report usually within fairly quickly within a week and how many where they are as far as the quota goes. And when the fishing's good, there's a good stretch of weather and a good bite. You do see that Massachusetts quota start to get filled pretty fast. Um, w- one of the things that I have no doubt has affected it a little bit so far this season is the fact that there have been so many very windy days. It has not been a great... Uh, a great June and July for boat fishing, I think, around New England. It's been a lot of wind. Yeah, we just coming out of the holiday weekend, and it was screaming northeast. Uh, excuse me, northeast most of the weekend. Before that, we had really heavy southwest. So it's it has been uh, hasn't been too friendly to us in this summer season to get out and and get out on the boats at least. So here we are now in July. We've done our last striper migration map. Um, Andrew, where are you seeing striper cup submissions coming from right now? Where are the big fish coming in or where are the good numbers of fish? The good numbers of fish right now are really coming in from, at least at the moment, Rhode Island and Massachusetts and into New Hampshire and Maine. Um, Usually at the first month of the striper cup or so, we don't really see much of anything coming in from New Hampshire and Maine. But now we're starting to see some some of those 40-inch class fish showing up there. I think it was two or three weeks ago now that we had our first uh, 40 inch plus fish taken uh, north of Massachusetts, and that was a 44 inch fish in New Hampshire. So, definitely the biomass is is heading up that way. And it's kind of funny that you guys mentioned the Manhattan earlier in the show too, because when we went out for our our party boat fishing trip for our new series called At the Rail, uh, we were we were targeting Haddock on Stellwagen, and as we were steaming back through Race Point and uh, Cape Cod Bay, there was massive schools of, of bunker and that was surprising to see in open water heading north pretty darn early in the season and then to two or three weeks later see those big fish appear uh well well north of provincetown i don't think that's a coincidence there no definitely not man and that was the middle of may we were seeing them there um on that haddock trip yeah i i i, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the the spring migration patterns have changed and again we're going to learn so much more about this the science is is advancing really fast. They're putting more and more tracking tags in striped bass. They are buoys set up that will ping. So when a striped bass swims by at a certain distance, there's a ping that lets you know that this tag striped bass swam by. 
And what that'll let us know is how many striped bass, for example, say are heading north through the Cape Cod Canal and how many are just appearing north of Cape Cod without pinging in the canal. So in other words, they went around the Cape in some way. And it'll take some time, year after year, of kind of building up that data. But I would not be surprised if you start to see that fewer fish than are going through the canal on that spring run north than in the past because they're following bunker schools. They're following those bunker schools right around the outer Cape, perhaps, like you said, you saw them on Stellwagen and pushing north like that. It would explain a lot of kind of what we've seen that shift in what used to be really dependable, heavy spring runs of fish up through Buzzards Bay and the Cape Cod Canal to more fish just seeming to magically appear uh, north of the Cape. So, you know, again, throwing out theories, but that's another one right there that with science advancing, we'll start to learn more about. Okay, let's 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 rate it. Let's all rate the recap. Kevin on a or Andrew on a scale of one to ten, rate the uh, twenty twenty one spring run. I'm going to give it a solid eight with a lot of big fish, not a lot of those you know thirty to forty inch fish, but a lot of quality fish around, a lot of healthy fish. So I'm going to give it an eight. I think that's a bit high, but I'm sticking to it. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm going to give it two ratings. I'm going to give it a, a six for overall. Um, I'm going to go a little lower. Part of that is, you know, anytime you're talking about how things have changed over time, um, you, you, it depends what your perspective is. I'm much older than Andrew, and I look back to the the heyday, the big, you know, the really good years of having so many fish around. And so I got to say that the fishing, you know, is not as good as it used to be in some ways. On the other hand, um, you know, I said six overall, I would go with an eight in terms of what I've seen in terms of smaller fish, um, schooly sized stripers, you know, and part of that could be the way that my fishing has changed. I'm doing a lot more fly fishing and looking for smaller fish, seeing a lot of good numbers of schooly sized stripers, seeing good numbers of stripers in the rips feeding on squid this spring. Um, I'm hopeful that what we're seeing is uh, a good, you know, resurgence. Some of these year classes that are going to replenish the population, and that we're on the way toward better fishing in the future. It really isn't. Um, it's not that bad now. There's still the striper fishing is still pretty incredible. It's a great fishery, but compared to what we've had in the past, when the striper population was at its peak, um, you know, a little down on it. But I think we're heading in the right direction. I think we're going to get back there, hopefully sooner rather than later. I'm definitely less uh, glass half full than you guys are. I'm going to give it a four. Um, part of, wow, part of the, that's well, just because you're just miserable. That's because you had. <laughs> that's because you had kids. <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with that. I only missed four nights of fishing in June, um, and what I noticed is that while I do think there's more large fish around, I think that overall the numbers. First off, the fishing, the good fishing seems shorter lived. It seems like it's narrow, more narrow windows. They're going to have that good fishing. It doesn't seem as widely spread. It seems to be more concentrated in certain areas. So that that's another thing. And I think that um, you know there there are there's definitely fewer fish. Um, but like Kevin and Andrew said, it does seem like things are moving in a positive direction. Um, I, I just I, I don't know. I, I I think it's a four. I can't give that give this season more than a more than a five because I haven't found uh, satisfaction with fly fishing and smaller fish the way Kevin has, um, <laughs> <laughs> or at least I can't fool myself into thinking that's fun the way he has. Um, but no, it is fun. It's uh, anyway catch a striped bass is fun. Yeah. So I guess that's you know that that brings it around. Depending on where you fish, how you fish. Um, you know, I think if you were a Raritan Bay fisherman in New Jersey, you would say this season was an 11 out of 10, probably. If, you, um, if you're a Cape Cod Canal fisherman, you're probably somewhere around a two. I mean, it was bad. So it really depends on kind of where you're fishing and, and what you like to do. And maybe that's a better indication than anything else at the fact that, this, like we said in the very, very beginning, the spring run, the striper population, it's gotten kind of choppy and fragmented. I remember doing the map. I used to feel very confident coloring in a whole area red and saying like, wow, the fishing is really, really good through this entire area from, from Northern New Jersey, Western Long Island, all the way up to, you know, say New Hampshire, there's a lot of big fish being caught and the fishing's good. And now it's kind of like, you know, there's some very good bites, you know, Montauk this past week, there was a great bite at Montauk. There's people getting really good fish in Block Island. Uh, there's a good bite of fish off of, say, outside Boston Harbor and north. Um, 
but it's kind of choppy, fragmented, discrete. It's because there aren't as many striped bass in the population, definitely not as many big ones. And the ones that are there are amassing around, you know, uh, schools of Menhaden, which do what they do. They form very tight schools in certain areas. And so that's, I think, the best way to kind of describe where the fishery is at. Um, but, we'll, you know, let us know in the comments. Are you glass half full like me or are you you know, smash the glass like Jimmy. <laughs> Are you just in, just happy to be drinking like Andrew? <laughs> that was good. That's a good end. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. This is the first week where we don't have the striper season, uh, striper migration map with it. We're not going to have another one until next March. Uh, we don't do a fall migration map. Um, as, uh, you know, relatively easy to predict as the uh, spring migration is the fall migration is a lot more weather dependent bait fish dependent it just seems a lot more scattered and difficult to call i i don't want to take that on um, yeah maybe we'll do a couple maps just to see what we can predict what we can you know it, we'll definitely talk about it we'll keep doing these we'll do these into the fall um and we'll talk about what we're seeing but yeah it is really tough the the move especially because spawning's not involved the move from north to south in the fall is tough to map out yeah, they seem to move a lot faster, I think, in the fall. We, we can talk about the fall run in a future one of these. Yeah, I've had requests to do a false albacore map, too, which just to me seems absolutely impossible. Just throw darts at it. You know, yeah. See where, see where they land. <laughs> All right. Well, if you haven't yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put out one of these every Friday. And uh, thanks for watching.